everybody. I'm Chris Primesberger, uh, an editor with ZDNet, a longtime journalist uh, writing about tech trends and new products. Welcome to our uh, to the Lo uh, Logistics and Tech Summit's FlexWork Roundtable. We're talking about the past, present, and future of gig work today. And uh, our two subject matter experts are with us, Kashek Pendurthy of Jobbox and Connor Lyons of Gigable. And uh, gentlemen, would you just please introduce yourself and your role at your company? Yeah, absolutely. I'll start. So my name is Connor Lyons. I'm the associate founder and product manager in Gigable. And Gigable is essentially a marketplace that connects freelance workers with local businesses in their area. So we have a web portal and a mobile app uh, where businesses will post uh, short-term shifts or gigs, as we like to call them. And freelancers in the area will then go on our mobile app and apply to those gigs. So there's kind of an open, transparent marketplace where businesses can choose the rates of pay and the time uh, of each shift or gig. And freelancers then have the ability then to choose who they work with uh, and then businesses can choose who represents their business. So it's a nice two-sided marketplace. Good. Kaushik? Hi, I'm Kaushik, uh, Kaushik Pendurthi. So uh, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Jobbox. At Jobbox, we are building the marketplace infrastructure platform where we are trying to connect businesses like Thumbtack, Yelps and all these uh, small players or uh, just the businesses that are put on Yelp or any other place to actually send the jobs to our platform and where we supply and aggregate all the technicians, field service professionals like locksmiths, car carpet cleaners, garage door gate repairmen. And we build the matching algorithms. We do everything in between and make sure that the marketplace succeeds as well as the businesses on the top and the people running uh, on our platform, like the technician workers, they succeed. This is what we're doing. Okay. Uh, gig work has changed a lot over the years, as we know, uh, where everybody was just a freelancer or a consultant or something like that. Um, it's become a lot more specific, and uh, there's a lot more tech now that can help people get jobs. And this is, and it doesn't matter about distance either. It's from wherever you are, you can get jobs pretty much. But thanks to your companies, you're really helping out. Can you, each of you, please describe? The key challenges and areas of improvement, or um, maybe opportunities for your organization or your customers. Connor, you want to go first on that? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, thinking back to when the gig economy was kind of conceptualized, you know, it was on the context is important. I think it was on the back of, you know, the 2008 financial crisis, got the proliferation of, you know, uh, iPhones and, and smartphones and these two things kind of coincided to this new opportunity to kind of, I think, redefine employment models, you know, and, and the gig economy was kind of born on the back of that. And I think not every, at the time, there was a lot of promise, a lot of exciting opportunity, but not everything kind of materialized the way that many had hoped. And I think there are kind of stigmas and shortcomings of the gig economy that have existed over the last decade that um, we're cer certainly trying to, to solve and to kind of um, reimagine how the gig economy should be, you know? Um, so one of the areas, for example, I think that's um, gets a lot of attention and kind of a poor reputation of the gig economy is the welfare of the workers involved. You know, I think um, everyone's seen the kind of headlines of, uh, you know, uh, different companies around the world who, and how they treat their employees. And, and, and I think fairness and transparency for gig workers is something that we take very seriously at Gigable. It's we have the three kind of values that we were founded on, which is uh, transparency, equal opportunity and independence. And so we're trying to use those values as we try to redefine and humanize the gig economy. I think um for example, giving driver benefits or, you know, the freelance workers that use our platform, uh, meaningful benefits like time off work, sick pay, these kind of benefits and um, fair wages, living wages, these do not kind of contradict the gig economy. I think they are a fundamental part of it. Um, and I think it's really, really important that we embrace those kind of core, you know, that those benefits and wages, especially will help in humanizing and redefining and removing those stigmas that kind of are associated with the gig economy. Right. And by the way, Connor, I think Gigable is probably, 
probably the best name that you could give a company involved in the game yeah. economy. I think that's pretty good. I'm glad you guys got that. Uh, Kashik, Kashik, what's your take on that? Yeah, uh, so slightly different take, but agreed with most of the things that Connor mentioned. One, because when we're talking about gig economy, we are talking about uh, not just the tech workers, not just a, a sort of workers who can work from far off distance, but these are also the people who are in the same area, in the same community, living along right next to you, but is not employed and is actually running his own business. For example, our, uh, at Jobbox, we are dealing with people like garage door re gate repairmen or locksmiths. These are the people that actually need to be at the site. But then again, uh, I do understand the fact that in the last few years, the mobile phone technology or the smartphones have actually made them be uh, much more accessible online, which means a lot of these websites can actually ping them, send them jobs and do things like that. That's number one. That was one of the key challenges when we started because the adoption was still in the beginning phases. Now that's not a problem. Now uh, on the supply side aggregation, definitely there are things which are on the benefit side, but more on the light when a marketplace is built in an asset light approach, the marketplace does not have the ability to actually provide a lot of benefits and things like that. But in order to give them an, a platform which allows them to purchase their own plants or allow them to have like access to all these kind of benefits in some or the other way, including health benefits and fair price, fair price because you don't want marketplace to dictate the price or undercut the price for the supply, which always happens uh, because when there is a competition, you always start undercutting each other. You don't want to do that. These are some of the problems that uh, we are facing in our industry as well. And uh, I would say that the biggest challenge at this point of time is to validate and wet on the supply side. This is one. And on the demand side to give an amazing experience without undercutting the supply side. Yeah, I definitely echo that. I think um, balancing the two sides is always very, very challenging. You have um, they often, you know, the, the demand for work often coincides with, um, you know, a shortage of gigs. You know, businesses might be less inclined to employ people during times of hardship. But it's also the times like the current cost of living crisis when uh, gig workers are looking for employment the most. So it's very hard to kind of balance those two sides at all times. Yeah, very COVID good. was an exact example because uh, during COVID, uh, when the revenues were already less, did it make sense to undercut the technician margin much more? at that point of time, or should the platform take that beating, or should the customer pay extra to bring it in? In the beginning, before the liquidity injection, the, the technician had to be undercut. And after the liquidity injection, the technician started making more money. This is the trend that we saw. Very good. Uh, Jobbox is not a bad name for a company either, Kashi. That's great. What role is logistics technology playing in improving the key performance, the productivity, and the reliability metrics for the gig workers in your organization or your customers? Um, you know, uh, Kashik, why don't we start with you on this one? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in terms of when you look at a, a business or a, a technician or a gig worker, the way I we break it into... Uh, break his business as two parts. One is how to run the business itself, like how to do tech accounting, taxes, record keeping, uh, workflow, all that kind of things. And the second part is like, how can he get more jobs to the business? So these are the two things that we absolutely identify and break them into two separate buckets, which we need to nail them independently to get the best uh, sort of uh, uh, like uh, stickiness from the user or the best experience for the user. So when we are trying to do this, we have fundamental key levers that we are trying to really get a, a best product over there. For example, we want to make sure that where he is at that point of time, the location services, we want to identify his phone book and keep track of all his phone calls. We want to make sure that it's deeply integrated into taxing services that are already available and he's already using maybe like QuickBooks and things like that. All these kind of integrations, things make it extremely uh, tight net uh, network for him. This is one part. And second part is like when you are getting him jobs, you want to identify a lot of different services or a lot of different ways in which you're filtering out bad jobs, you're filtering out uh, 
under uh, like low price jobs or the customers who potentially could cause disputes at later points of time or bad actors in the game or in any way to avoid the waste of time so for example from the perspective of a technician i'm speaking always about locksmiths and carpet cleaners uh, forgive me that because i live in that ecosystem all the time so when a technician picks up a phone and uses job box application he gets a job from the job box already validated vetted where to go how to go uh, what kind of uh, tools are needed for it and how much of uh, what is the probability of uh, uh, it getting completed or even the price at which it can get completed these are excuse me these are all the things that are provided to him right when the job comes in he looks at all these details and he actually decides on his own whether he wants to accept it or not and once he accepts it he goes and finishes the job then there is the whole new ecosystem that opens up which is post job completion support the job is completed the payment is taken the payment reconciliation happens and then what if there is a dispute what if there is a repeated uh, uh, like uh, uh, the next set of uh, conversations that are happening with the customer all that kind of support is provided by jobbox so these all tools and integrations this is what uh, makes it extremely uh, sticky for our user okay connor what's uh, what's gigable's uh, perspective on that question yeah so logistics technology is is an essential part of our platform at the moment um so to give you more context the type of uh, gigs or jobs that are available on our platform it's generally food delivery will be the the vast majority of our the gigs that are available um, but we also are exploring other industries for example uh, events like um getting security guards or event stewards in at festivals or or concerts or things like that so having the ability to track all of our freelancers and for businesses who use gigable to track all our freelancers um is really really important um in food delivery we have uh, so in our app you know drivers will receive orders through our integrations that we have available and they'll mark those orders as picked up and delivered as they kind of go to the life cycle of a of a, a typical food delivery um and with hypertrack we're now able to show our businesses where those drivers are and they can see the points in time when those uh, orders get updated so when an order is picked up or where it's marked as delivered and through the um different features available through hypertrack like geofencing for example we're able to determine and give feedback to our businesses um give them really interesting insights and metrics as to like how long a freelancer or you know a delivery person was at a particular location how long were they waiting in the restaurant before they went to pick up an order how long was the service time and handing the order to the 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 end consumer um and then they can start to build this really nice picture of efficiency and who were their most efficient freelancers and um building out these kind of metrics are a really really important part of our product in addition to that it's not just food delivery we also as i said um work with events companies and especially around security for events and they're able to have um uh, maybe 100 200 plus freelancers all checked into a gig at one time and they can see exactly where they are on a map they can see th- where the concert is they can see that their security guards are in the right locations and it creates this amazing picture and it really helps us compete with some of our competitors um you know we can build these kind of white label solutions with hypertrack to allow them to build things like a branded sms tracking link that really big players in the gig economy have like the likes of deliveroo and uber eats we're able to build these features now um which makes us a much more attractive proposition i suppose for our customers it's astounding to me as a, a layman not in your business but as a person who's studying tech and uh in this all of this um to see how the dots are all connected in the, within the metrics to get a job done and get a service completed it's astounding and then you're keeping all that data aren't you uh for use in the future right um yeah exactly you know it's a really valuable thing you know obviously yeah. um businesses that use us start to collect more and more information about you know even as a restaurant you can imagine they can identify areas where they're delivering food to but more yeah. importantly areas they're not delivering food to and that offers new opportunities for them to explore promoting their business in that area or you know um sky's the limit i think once you have the right tools right yeah. in addition to that connor uh, i think uh, 
in, in a situation where the marketplace actually picks the technician to go to the job, in our case, we actually use HyperTrack more on the perspective of like identifying all the technicians around, running algorithms on top of it to see who is the closest person to the job and actually identifying that in a very fast and a timely manner and sending uh, the first one. If the first one does not want to take the job, then picking up the second or third one and identifying the right set of people who are close to it, it's, it's extremely important for us. So when the marketplace picks the technician, it's just not like reporting the data, but I think we have like a lot of value after taking the data and building an algorithm on top of it as well. What are some of the business, the business benefits that your companies realize um, with the, our uh, people realize with logistics technology at your organization? Um, uh, Connor, you want to go on that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like touched on a few of the points, you know, previously, but I think ultimately, I think the technology facilitates insights, you know, under better understanding. It's not just about and the different features we can build, but it's also understanding how well everything is working. I think that's, you know, um, you can imagine a small business, small restaurant having access to information they could never dream of, you know, and right. I think that really empowers a business and makes them be able to make really informed data-driven decision-making. Um, and not all platforms do that. You know, sometimes platforms will withhold the data for themselves and, you know, the business owns this data they should be able to use it so like share it with them and i think that's that's something that hypertrack allows us to do which which we obviously are, are um really appreciative of and that's why we have such a great partnership i think with them Good. yeah I, it, it's also speed to the market because you don't want to build all these things on your own you want to go as fast as possible that's number one and when you do build or when you're trying to use a partner uh, the the most important thing that you look for is accuracy and the SLAs that the partner could provide to you in order to make your work be successful. So I think HyperTrack over there does a pretty good job with giving us like speed to market. We could immediately launch things like matching algorithm upgrades or maybe even have like a web link sent to the technician, uh, the customer where the customer can see how the technician is driving towards him or like what's the ETA and things like that. Those are like quick things that we could do. And because they're accurate, I think it's an aha moment for our customers as well and our technicians as well when they see big features being deployed right away. Very good. Um, I've always been interested in the scalability of how all these services work and astounding. I'm just astounded by the accuracy and the scalability of, this, of your, your technology because it's just never ending. You're always going to get bigger. What are your plans uh, for the future rollout of business process and technology changes to improve the performance, reliability, productivity, and I dare say scalability of the gig work economy? Um, Connor, you want to go with that? Yeah, sure. Um, again, going back to data, I think it's really important. <laughs> so as we, you know, build out our product more and more, you know, we've, we've a long roadmap with you know, a long list of features that we plan on building. And I think a lot of it feeds into insights, you know, being able to, um, again, understand your own employees or the gig workers that you hire, how efficient they are, being able to build a leaderboard, let's say, of all the workers that you've hired and understand what makes them efficient or what doesn't. And um, again, using the example of like service time at particular locations, or you can see if if gig, the gig workers you're hiring are are not actually doing the job that you've hired them for, and um, you know being able to detect that is really really important. You know, a really valuable thing we have is from HyperTrack as well is being able to play back uh, one of our gigs. You know, so the gig is recorded, and um, from the moment that a freelancer checks in, and they also kind of check out, so they're kind of clocking in and clocking out. And we record all the, the information that happens in the gig during that period of time. But if there's ever a dispute or something about an order or, you know, there's a, a need to go back and play that back, we can do so. And I think yeah. building on top of this kind of technology more and more and the more features we develop, you know, it's all going to build towards this ultimate goal of having a, you know, all of the information in one place, all of the data is freely available for our users and they can, you know, deep dive and really understand their own business um, by using our platform. 
Did you uh, did I hear you say, Connor, that the the virtual time clock in and out is that a future feature you're working on, or do you have that now? No, we have that now. So that's something that we have currently. Um, but okay. I suppose something that we're building towards is um, the insights that you get from that. You know, ah. um, and a lot of the data is there, but we just have to kind of utilize it, and, and yeah. that's the next challenge for us. Yeah. Yeah, Joe Smith's been late three days in a row. I don't know about that. You got to check it out. Find out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That kind of okay. stuff. Kashik, what's your take on that? Uh, so, our most primary, first and the foremost primary feature that we are building is the matching algorithm. So, we will be refining matching algorithm much more deeper with HyperTrack. And uh, I also believe with like huge amounts of data and huge technicians and job density in a specific area, the data handling at that scale would become a huge problem. And uh, we are not seeing any signs of problems with HyperTrack. We definitely are seeing them be able to keep their SLAs, respond really fast and things like that. So that is one area where we will be definitely focusing on. And second part is uh, we would be focusing on things like uh, geofencing for the customers and also consumer side applications where they would want to have a set of surveys uh, and they are not at home and they want to come home and then let the technician be in or when the technician comes home, only then the, tech, uh, the customer wants to provide an access key to the house and things like that. So those are additional top-up features that will enhance the experience of the customer as well as the pro uh, professional or the technician that is working on our business. And more importantly, we have some of the simulation ideas that we are, which are still in the nascent stages. Uh, something like, hey, Joe, you've not been uh, working for the last three days and in your job, in your density, uh, sorry, in your geofence, you have actually a potential of making $300 a day, which you're probably losing. So you can come back and do it or probably think something like uh, you're in San Francisco working over weekends. Why don't you go to Sacramento? You can actually make a lot more earning over there. That kind of thing, that kind of insights to their personal business. These are uh, some of our future plans. Wow, that's that's really interesting. All the options that you'll be able to throw into this app. This has really been a great insight into the what you your companies do for the gig economy, and um, I know that um, a lot of people are being educated, hopefully by this conversation. Um, and you know, we've got about a thousand or more people here at the conference here today. What's your advice for the you know for these these logistics tech builders and the executives who run these companies? Uh, what's your advice for attending? The uh, this conference, this summit, the logistics and tech summit. What would you like them to know? Um, toss up, either one of you. Who, who whoever speaks first? <laughs> yeah, I could go for it. Uh, so one of the biggest learnings we had in the last few years when we started marketplace was uh, the marketplace can be broken into two parts. One is the fundamentals of algorithms or fundamentals of uh, crank wheels that you need for the marketplace to run. And then your personal experience and the flavor of like what industry you're bringing in, the knowledge of the industry and applying it on top of the marketplace to really make it successful. Now, the crank wheels, the nuts and the bowls, I think my biggest suggestion would be to go use the best player out there to use them and build on top of it. And the flavor is something that is your recipe. That's your secret sauce that you're always putting and making the marketplace function very well. So... I would say immediately try to find the best leader for each of the logistic provider uh, or the matching algorithm or the, the dispute resolution, or maybe it could be payments, but start from there. That would be my biggest suggestion. And second thing, uh, always work very closely with the companies that are providing solutions for you so you can influence their roadmap and make sure that they are building something that aligns with your roadmap in the longer term. Uh, these companies want to build what you want to use, but the thing is, most of the times they don't do it because of the miscommunication or probably lack of communication in the first place. Right. Connor? Yeah, I suppose, you know, the advice I'd give as, as a startup, we've often attempted to build things ourselves and have done so successfully. And um, when it comes to things like logistics and building technology on that, it's not always wise to go down that road because I think there's a lot of complexity to it. And I think understanding the industry 
to a point helps, but once you start to delve into the nuances of it, you realize that there's a lot of other features or other other capabilities out there. Um, for example, like working with HyperTrack over the last year, we've um, been able to come up with a lot of exciting new features that we would never would have thought of otherwise because we didn't understand the true capabilities uh, that were on offer. And that's only because, you know, we didn't have enough experience or knowledge of the industry. But, you know, now in hindsight, I think trying to do things ourselves was always going to slow us down. So I think working with someone who's flexible and um, able to give you the kind of features or kind of uh, capabilities that you need for your product or your platform, whatever it might be, um, talk with experts, talk with people who know the in industry inside out, and you'll be surprised with the kind of uh, the capabilities that are out there and the kind of features that you can make. Very good. Hey, I want to thank you two for your really valuable insight into the technology of the gig economy. Your companies are really on the cutting edge of uh, what's happening out there. You're the pioneers out there and um, others are going to follow you going forward, but you're already pretty, pretty well implanted in your lane. So congratulations on that, both of you. Um, so I want to thank uh, Kashik Pendurthi of, of um, Jobbox and then Connor Lyons of Gigable for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us all today. My name is Chris Primesberger with ZDNet. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much.